Hey everybody, it's Alex with Engineering Applied. In this video, I'll be giving you a detailed overview of the assembly constraints found within an Autodesk Inventor assembly file. If you want more easy to understand and practical content like this made by an experienced engineer like myself, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on notifications so you don't miss out on any helpful content like this in the future. If you're looking for a specific function, check the description for timestamps. And if you don't find what you're looking for in this video, make sure you check out the other videos in my Autodesk Inventor series playlist because I know you'll find exactly what you need there. Let's get started. Okay, everybody, so here we are in our assembly file. And for this practical example, we'll be taking a look at a draft shield that I modeled up. So essentially what a draft shield does is we put a high precision scale on the inside of this enclosure and the shield will prevent any of the air from our HVAC system from blowing on the scale directly and ruining the stability of our measurements. Additionally, this enclosure keeps out any sort of foreign objects or debris from getting on the scale itself and potentially ruining an extremely expensive and precise piece of equipment. Now, I've used these enclosures quite a bit in the pharmaceutical industry, and I wanted to share my experience with you because I always like to connect the dots between these lessons and reality so that you get more out of them. So the way this lesson will be structured is we'll take various design elements from this assembly and apply the relevant constraints to those design elements so that we can get our desired result without having to build this thing from the ground up and wasting a bunch of your time. So the first constraint that we want to take a look at is our mate constraint. So here I have just some frame pulled up. So this is T slot frame in our 3D space. And this is the beginning of our enclosure assembly itself. So if we go back to our enclosure, you'll see we're starting with this bottom frame section here and using the mate constraint as part of that section. OK, so we'll go back to this tab and then now let's go up to the relationship section and click on constraint. After clicking constraint, we get the place constraint dialog box that pops up. And then you'll notice our assembly constraints tab is pre-selected. So in this video, we'll be only looking at the assembly tab. Um, in other videos, I cover the motion constraints, the transitional constraints, and the constraint set tab individually, just to make it easier for you to navigate. Moving back to our assembly tab and going down to our type section here, this is where we can select the type of assembly constraint that we want. So you'll see we can pick up our mate constraint. That's this first one here. And let's go ahead and start making some constraints. So let's move over to our selection section where we can pick up the various geometrical elements we want to use to create those constraints with. I went ahead and scrambled up the parts in 3D space a little bit so that we can get them back into alignment using the make constraint. So um, what we want to do first, and I generally recommend doing this when you create a new assembly, is find the first part that you want to ground at the origin or position in 3D space such that you can build off of that one part. That way the whole assembly doesn't move around and you have a strong anchor point um, as you go through and build your assembly up. So when we anchor the first part, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to snap the um, origins, the local origins for this T slot segment here with the global origin that's associated with the assembly itself. So uh, let's go ahead and snap this YZ plane to um, the YZ plane of the assembly. OK, we'll hit apply. And then now let's go ahead and select the XZ plane with the XZ plane of the origin. OK, hit apply. And then now let's snap the two center points to one another. OK, hit OK. And then now when we go to click and drag the part, it's not going anywhere. And now we have a stable anchor point for the rest of our assembly. Alternatively, you can use the place command to bring in the part that you're going to use as your anchor point. And before you drop it, you can right click and then select place grounded at origin. OK, so it'll drop it into 3D space. And now when we click OK and go to drag this around, it's not moving because it's currently grounded. And you know it's grounded when you see that little push pin with the ground symbol next to it. Now, before we move on, I want to go ahead and address a major detail here when using the selection filter, and that is which part moves to which part. Well, whichever part that you select first will move to the part that you select second. So for example, if I want to mate this front face of this part to this front face here, I would select this one first because I want this part to move. So the part you want to move, you select it first, and then let's select this one here second. So we'll select that face there and you'll see they snap together. Now that they're connected, face to face, I want to go ahead and make another point here, and that is the solution section. So the solution section governs what 
the output looks like. So the first option is mate, and mate will put those faces I've selected facing one another this way. If I select flush, it'll take those original arrows that are normal to the faces that I selected and align them in the same direction. So if I select this, it'll flip it in the other direction and it'll make it flush with one another. Taking a step back, let's take a look at this option here, which allows us to pick the part first and then the specific geometrical element we want to use to create that mate with. So let's go ahead and check this box and see what it does. So when I check this box and I hover over my part of interest, you'll see the entire part is highlighted first. So without this enabled, I pick up the individual geometrical element, okay? But let's say I have... Um, a complicated assembly where there's a section that I want to pick up, but it's housed within the assembly itself and I can't really see that section to pick it up. Well, what you can do is you check this box and then you hover over the piece that you want. So let's say I wanted to pick up an element that's behind this piece and I can't see it. So I can hover over this rail left click it and now I can pick up the geometrical element of interest and when I hover over this part it doesn't give me any selection so that is some extra control that I have available to me by using the pick part first option so now I can pick up the element I want so let's go ahead and just snap this face to the front of this again pick this rail okay and then we'll select this front face and then it'll snap those two facing one another and then I can hit okay Moving down, we have our offset section. So this essentially does exactly what it says and we can create an offset using this value. So let's go ahead and create an offset between this top face and the bottom face of this rail. So we'll select this top face because this is the part we wanna move first. And let's move it up to this bottom face. Okay, and once they snap together, we can go into this offset box and type in a value. So let's type in half an inch, okay. So now that we typed in 0.5, it creates a half inch offset there. And if I were to hit OK, you'll see that I can move these parts around, but it'll always maintain that half an inch offset. Additionally, what you can do is after snapping these two parts together, so I'll just repeat that operation, um, you can actually measure a feature dimension within your model and use that value as your offset value. So click this right arrow here and go to measure. And let's say, for example, I want that offset to be equal to the thickness of one of these rails or the height of one of these rails. So I'll pick this bottom face here and I'll pick this top face here after I've already clicked measure. And it'll set that gap to the thickness or the height of one of these rails. Moving down, we can actually toggle our preview option here by unchecking that box and checking it back on if we want it. So uh, for example, let's see what it does when we have it enabled. So we'll just select this face and this face, and you'll see it gives us that preview. But now let's take a step back. So we'll hit cancel. We'll go to constrain, but let's uncheck this first. Now let's go ahead and pick up our same two faces. And when we do that, the part doesn't automatically snap in place and give us a preview. But when we hit OK, it'll fulfill that command for us. So um, just depending on your preference within your workflow, you can either enable or disable those previews. This next option allows the software to predict the offset and orientation of our two mated parts. So let's go ahead and enable that. And um, let's say, for example, that I just was sort of eyeballing the location of this T-slot frame here, and I want to maintain the gap that I currently have set between this top face and this bottom face. So what I can do is sort of drag it into place, into 3D space, and then now I can go ahead and click this top face click this bottom face. And when I do that with this option checked, it will automatically set that offset value in my offset box, okay? So um, this is really helpful for when you just wanna eyeball the location and offset of various components within your assembly, and you don't exactly know what that offset is going to be. So you can enable this, it will retain that orientation or try to predict that orientation and offset for you. Moving down, we have our name field, and this is where we can enter a custom name for our constraint. So let's go ahead and click in this box, and let's just type in um, example, okay? And let's go ahead and set this surface flush with this top surface here on this rail. Now you'll notice it gave me the incorrect solution, it gave me mate, so I wanna go ahead and switch this to flush, so it sets those two arrows in the same direction rather than opposing directions, okay? So now that we have that, we'll hit okay, and underneath the T slotted frame number three, you'll see that the relationship that's applicable to that frame, it says example. So that's that mate that I just applied with that custom name. 
Let's go ahead and continue on down to our limit section. And if I didn't mention it before, the way you access this extended menu is you click on these little arrows in the bottom right hand corner of your screen for the additional menu options. So um, essentially what the limits allow us to do is it allows us to set a range for the movement um, of the mate between our two components. Let's go ahead and mate this face to this face here. Okay, we'll go ahead and set an offset value of half an inch. And this first checkbox essentially allows us to set whatever is in our offset box as our resting position. So that is this gap in our assembly by default. Okay, so by default, we're going to keep that half inch gap and then we can enable or disable our max and min values for the distance between these two faces. So let me go ahead and rotate this around. OK, and let's set our maximum value to two and a half inches and we'll set our min to 0.250. OK, so our minimum separation will never fall below a quarter of an inch and then our maximum will never go above two and a half inches. So once we have those parameters set, we can hit OK. And I want to note that I am going to ground this in 3D space so that this can't move around. So I'm clicking and dragging this. It's not moving. So I'm going to click and drag this part. I can bring it in, but you'll see it stops as I'm pulling it over. You'll see that mouse cursor moving to the left. The part won't actually go below a quarter of an inch and in gap between the other rail. Now let's go the other direction. So I'm pulling it outwards. You'll see it stops at two and a half inches. OK, now one thing I want you to notice is when I let go of left click on the mouse, it pops back into its default position. So it works in both directions. So we've seen that we can mate faces to one another, edges and so on and so forth. But what about rounded or cylindrical features? Well, in this particular case, what we can do is we can mate this open side of the hinge to this pin on the fixed side of the hinge. OK, so I have my door. It's free floating in 3D space. So what I want to do is go to constrain. OK, make sure it's on mate. And then when I hover over any rounded feature, so I'll hover over this outside piece, you'll see that dashed line. That's the axis that runs through the center. But in this case, we want to pick up this pin here. So we'll left click and you'll see it selects the axis and you'll see the axis direction. Uh, green arrow is pointing up. OK, so take note of that. So let's pick this intersection and it snaps the two together. Now, over here in the solution section, this is where we control the alignment of our two constrained parts. So currently it's on opposed. So um, the arrow for this segment of the hinge that's attached to the door panel is facing down. And this arrow on the stationary portion of the hinge is facing up. So they're going in opposite directions. This is the opposed solution. We can also align it. So when we click that, it actually inverts the door and puts it inside out. OK, so now the two green arrows are facing in the same direction. We actually don't want it that way. Now, the last option is the undirected solution option. So essentially all this does is instead of defaulting the orientation to opposed or aligned, it just snaps it to its closest axis. So, for example, we can actually set undirected by default. And then when we're working with our model, we can manually move and rotate the part around, get it close enough to the final position and then use undirected to finally snap it into place rather than risking it um, inverting into a different orientation if we don't want it to do that. And of course, everywhere else in this dialog box for this particular type of mate constraint, we have the same settings. So we have offset, we have the prediction setting, we have our limits and so on and so forth. Now let's go ahead and complete this constraint. So you see we've snapped the two um, axis elements together, but the gap between these two hinge elements are sort of off a little bit, okay? So let's go ahead and apply the first change, but then let's go ahead and set a mate constraint between this top face and the bottom face of this stationary hinge element, okay? Let's set this offset to about six thousandths of an inch. That should be close enough to what we need it to be. We'll hit OK. Let's go to this view here so we can get a better look at it. Our gap looks pretty even there. And uh, now let's see what happens when we click and drag on the handle. Now you can see our mate constraint is exactly as we intended it to be. The next constraint we want to go ahead and take a look at is the angle constraint. So using the angle constraint, we're going to set the angle and uh, travel of this door. So you can see currently it's able to free spin all the way around. We don't actually want it to be like that. So what we're going to do first is we're going to go to constraint and then click on angle. 
And you'll see here in our solution section, we have three main solutions. Our first solution is going to be the directed angle solution. So what we want to do is pick our first element on our moving component, which is going to be the door. So let's select this front face here and you'll see that little green arrow is normal to that front face. So that's our uh, selection in this particular case. And then let's go ahead and do the same thing on this crossbar. OK, and then let's go ahead and set an angle value. Now, one thing I want you to note is in this particular case, the angle is set um, counterclockwise. Again, we're using the right hand rule. And uh, so if I want the door opened out here somewhere in space at 135 degrees from this direction, I can either type in 225 here and it'll open up the amount that I want. Or I can type in negative 135 and it'll go in the opposite direction, but it'll achieve the same result. Now let's go ahead and click OK and see what happens. Now you'll see that I clicked OK, but when I click and drag this, that angle is set in stone. It's not going to move anywhere. And that's not necessarily what we want in this case because we want to control its opening and closing abilities based on that angle. So let's go back into the angle constraint and take another look at this. So let me delete that first. Go back into constraint, click angle, and then let's take a look at our second option, our undirected angle. So following the same order of operations as with our directed angle, let's see what happens with the undirected angle. So we'll select our front face on the door, our front face on the crossbar, let it snap into place. And so by default, it's ending up at zero degrees with the door closed. So now one thing I want you to notice is if we scroll down to this additional extension of our menu, we have the ability to set limits. Since we want the door in its closed position to be our resting position, let's go ahead and check this box here that says use angle as resting position. We have zero in that box. OK, so now we need to set our maximum and our minimum values for our limits. So our maximum is going to be 135 degrees and our minimum is going to stay at zero. Now, I want you to notice the behavior of this when we use the undirected angle option. I'll click OK. And then let's go ahead and grab this handle and pull it open and see what happens. OK, so I'm pulling it open and it gets to a certain point and it just sort of freezes there. So let me try that again. So I pull it out and it sort of stops. OK, it locks into place. And then when I let it go, it snaps to the other side. Well, that's not exactly what we want. And what's happening is past its zero point, it's able to rotate 135 degrees in either direction. So that is what the undirected angle allows you to do. So if you have an open door to where it's able to swing on either side, this would be the ideal option for you. But in this particular case, this is not what we want since we need the door to stop at the zero position. Now notice because I set the resting position at zero degrees, when I pull it off of zero degrees and leave it sort of in that area and then let the mouse go, it clicks back into position. So on either side, it rests back at zero. But again, that's not exactly what we want. So let's move on to the next option and see if we can achieve what we're looking for. So our final solution option is the explicit reference vector option. Here we can select the cross product vector or the Z axis for this operation, which will limit the rotation direction to a single direction. Let's go ahead and click our first entry, which will be the front face of this door. We're repeating our steps just as we did before. And then we're going to click this front face on the crossbar. And then we have a third selection for our reference vector. So let's go ahead and click one of these edges here to uh, use as our cross product vector. And then now we go to our angle box. We want to leave it at zero because um, we want zero degrees to be our resting position. But if we are unsure which direction this is going to rotate, you can go ahead and enter a value. So we want to be at 135 degrees and you'll see it rotates out to the proper area. Um, you could set negative values to see what happens when you do that. So it'll go in the opposite direction. So depending on what you want, you can type in those values accordingly. So let's set that back to zero. OK, then let's uh, use that as our resting position toggle our maximum value on and set that to 135 degrees. So that way the door can only go out to 135 degrees and then we'll set our minimum to zero degrees. Let's hit OK. And there we go. Now let's go ahead and test out this door handle. So let's go ahead and click and drag our handle. So I'll go ahead and rotate this around a little bit, clicking and dragging. And once I get past a certain point, you'll see that the door snaps back to zero. So I'm hitting my 135 degree limit and then it snaps back to zero. Let's go ahead and try to go in the other direction. So I'm going inwards and you'll see it doesn't move past zero degrees. That's exactly what we want to do in this particular case, since we have this little magnetic latch here that doesn't allow it to go beyond zero degrees. 
Now, let's say, for example, you want to go in the other direction. So what you want to do is making the same selections. We'll select the door, crossbar, and then our uh, reference vector. We want to go inwards by 80 degrees. So let's go ahead and type in negative 80 degrees just to verify that's the direction we want to go. And that looks correct. So what we want to do in this case is set this back to zero if we want the latch area to be our zero position. What we can do is use that as our resting position toggle max and min on, but this time our maximum is going to be zero degrees and our minimum is going to be our limit in this direction. Okay. So we can type in negative 80 there. Now um, let's try to type in negative 80 here and put zero here. You'll notice the number is put in red because it's out of range. The software doesn't understand what we're trying to do here because of our cross product vector. So we just need to invert these two values. So again, this will be zero. And since we're going the negative direction, we'll use our minimum value to set that limit in this direction, negative 80, hit okay. And then now this time I can't pull the door outwards, but I can push it inwards and it'll stop at 80 and then it'll snap back to zero. Our next constraint type is the tangent constraint. So with the tangent constraint selected in the type section, what we're going to do in this example is uh, constrain this curved surface on this caster wheel to this flat surface on this plate here. So what we want to do is select the curved surface on our moving part. Then we want to select the flat plate that it's constrained to. When we do that, you'll see it snaps into place and we have two solutions that are available to us. So currently it's set to outside. So that means the wheel is outside of this plate sitting on the surface. If we select inside, the wheel will go to the inside of that surface. So depending on what you're trying to do, you have those two options available to you. And of course you can set your offset value, name your component and set your limits as necessary. So let's go back to outside. We'll click OK. And then now when we move this part around, it rides on that surface. OK, so it's tangent to that surface at all times. Our next constraint option is the insert constraint. So what insert allows us to do is it allows us to align multiple axis elements and snap edges to one another. So in this example, what we want to do here is we want to thread these fasteners through these holes and then secure them with these cap nuts on the other side, just like you see up here. Now, um, the distinction between the insert option and the mate option is when we select mate, it only picks up the axis in the center. But the problem here is, is when we, um, you know, connect that to this axis, and hit OK, I can still move this fastener in and out of this hole. Now, what will happen when we use the insert option is it'll do two operations with one step. So let's go back to constrain. We'll go back to insert. OK, now let's pick up the same area, but you'll notice I see an edge with an axis. So let's pick up this edge and axis by clicking once. It'll select them both at one time. And then let's select the edge that that bottom uh, surface of the screw will rest on. So it's going to be this edge here. We'll select that. It snaps into place. We can also change the uh, solution here. So currently it's opposed. We can align it as well, but we want it opposed. Let's go ahead and click OK. Now this time when we click and drag the fastener, it doesn't move in and out. It only can rotate, but we can actually fix that as well. So if we go back into here, we can go ahead and lock the rotation. So let's take a couple steps back. OK, let's try that again. Go to constrain, insert. We'll select the fastener. OK, we're going to select this edge because this is where we want it to rest against. We'll go ahead and pre-select this lock rotation option. OK, we'll go down to our spot that we want to rest it on, which is that edge there. You'll see that our rotation is locked. And when we hit OK, now everything is completely locked down. It won't move in and out and it won't rotate. So um, if you're trying to place a bunch of fasteners quickly, this is a good way to do it. Now, let's go ahead and do the same thing for the cap nut on the other side. So we'll go to constrain, insert. OK, let's rotate this around a little bit. Zoom in on this part. We'll pick up this edge here. OK, and then let's go down uh, to this fastener on the other side. We'll pick up this edge here in the door panel and you'll see it locks into place and then we can lock the rotation once again. And then, of course, you have your offset options, your limit options, your naming options. We'll hit OK. And there we go. Now everything is locked into place. And when I click and drag on that cap nut, it's not moving anywhere. And then we can repeat those operations uh, for the second set of fasteners down here, put them into place, and then move along as intended.
Our final constraint type is the symmetry constraint. So with the symmetry constraint, we can keep these T-slot frame segments symmetrical about this YZ plane. So we'll go ahead and make our first selection. So I want this first face and the second face to hold symmetry about this plane, okay? Now, um, you'll notice we have a third selection filter. This is to select our symmetry plane, which is this YZ plane. OK, and then now we can set our solution type. So currently these green arrows are facing one another. That means they are opposed. OK, we can also align them. So you'll see this part actually flips around. So the entire part flips. OK, um, so that will give you an aligned solution. Um, so let's go ahead and go back to opposed. And then, of course, you can rename uh, this entity as well. We'll go ahead and hit OK. And now when I click and drag these components, they move with symmetry about that YZ plane. Now, before I go ahead and wrap up this video, there's one last thing I'd like to discuss, and that's using the Alt key on the keyboard to create mates without actually going into the constrain option up here in the relationships section. So in this example, all we're doing is we're going to mate this front face with this front face and align two sides to these two sides here. So um, what I'm doing now is I'm holding left alt on the keyboard. And while holding alt, you hover over the face of interest that you want to click and drag and uh, we'll left click and hold on the mouse. And you'll notice when we pull the mouse away a little bit, you get this blue um, highlight on the face of interest. And that's the face we actually want to create a mate with. So now we'll move it over to this face while holding left click and then release left click. And you'll see once we do that, we can click and drag this around and it's mated to that front face. So these two faces are mated, but we wanna go ahead and take this a couple steps further and we want to align this top surface with this surface and this side surface with this side surface. Now let's go ahead and repeat our previous steps. So this time I actually wanna grab this curved edge here and made it to this edge here so that we can lock it into place in one move. So I'm holding alt on the keyboard and then I'm going to hover over this edge, left click and hold. I'm going to drag away just a little bit and you'll see that edge is selected. Now I can hover over this edge, release left click. It drops it into place. And now when I click and drag this, it all moves together. And I didn't even have to go into the constrain option and use these tools in here to do that. Just holding alt on the keyboard and moving and clicking and dragging the parts will get this done for you. That's all for this segment of the Autodesk Inventor Assembly Creation Module, where I give you an overview of the assembly constraints. I really hope that you found this tutorial to be helpful and that you put what you've learned into practice so you can continue developing your skills as you work your way through these lessons. Also, before you watch the next video in this series, make sure you subscribe to my channel and turn on notifications to stay up to date on future content that will help you create the future you want for yourself. And of course, don't hesitate to leave a comment or reach out via my website contact page and let me know if there's anything else you'd like to learn about or see on this channel. I really appreciate you choosing stop by and learn with me and I'll see you again soon.